Professor Chomsky, what a pleasure to have you today. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about two things because you're an icon of free speech and of criticism of U.S. foreign policy. Both are very interesting to me. Let's talk about free speech. The left used to be associated with free speech. Does the left care about free speech now as much as they did in the 60s and 70s? Well, there are... Uh uh, for, uh, there were the, the struggle for free speech in the 60s and the 70s was an effort to break through constraints against what could be articulated and what people could hear. Actually, the notion of freedom of speech is uh, not so trivial. So take, say, the First Amendment of the Constitution. It doesn't really say very much, but the way it's been interpreted over the years, there are two dimensions to it. One is the freedom to, from a government constraint. And notice that not freedom from corporate constraint, which is very severe, I can give examples, but freedom from government constraint. The other dimension is the uh, freedom to obtain information and to express oneself. Now that's different, uh, and in fact, if you look at the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, of the United Nations, the article, I think it's Article 19, that's concerned with this, uh, speaks of the freedom to impart and receive information. Now if you go back to the early history of the United States, the founding fathers were concerned with both rights. So the state policies, things like uh, postal rules and others, were designed to permit the freest possible imparting of information, expression of opinion, but also of receiving information. Well, Professor, I, I want to go back to the, the thing you said at, at first, which was that uh, in the 60s and 70s, it was about breaking through, and especially about protesting the Vietnam War and other social change, civil rights movements for African Americans. But I, I want to follow up on that, because it seems to me that now that the 60s leftists have broken through, have taken over the dean's offices and the highest political offices, a 60s activist, community organizer is now the president, or at least in the mold of a 60s activist, is that why today's leftists are the enforcers of speech codes, whereas in the 60s they would have protesting outside the dean's office. Now they're the ones with the politically correct speech codes because they got their way, so they don't need the tool of free speech anymore. It was just a temporary weapon to smash the conservative hegemony. I don't think that's true at all. The constraints on uh, breaking through uh, to the public are probably greater than they were in this, or at least comparable to what they were in the 60s. So where are the leftist free speech activists today? Aren't they now the enforcers of political correctness on uh, conservative ideas on gender or, or sexual orientation. Aren't there more speech codes being enforced by leftists now than ever before? Uh, that's a dramatic exaggeration. Okay, the well, how big a problem is it? restrictions on uh, freedom of expression and uh, come uh, from the uh, corporate sector, uh, the state sector, and they're, very, they're pretty rigid. So nothing prevents me from saying in the United States that uh, the Iraq war was the worst crime in the 21st century, but I can't publish, I can't, I can only reach uh, very marginal uh, audiences on what is a pretty obvious fact. There are very, you can say in the United States within the mainstream that the Iraq war was a strategic blunder as Obama did. But try saying that it's uh, a crime of aggression of the kind that uh, led to the hanging of uh, Nazi war criminals at Nuremberg. Uh, try to write an op-ed about that. But, but, you're, but aren't you confusing things, Professor? Aren't you saying my power to force someone else to carry my views is a res my lack of that power to make ABC, CBS, NBC carry my views is a form of censorship? Isn't that, that's not censorship, that's their right to be free from your views. Whereas if you said certain things on campus about sexuality, about women's, uh, women or, or minorities, you wouldn't just face a lack of 
media that would carry your views, you would face student misconduct hearings, you would be expelled, you would be uh, drummed out of institutions. I'm not talking about someone refusing to print your op-eds, I'm talking about someone proactively gagging you. It is a very marginal phenomenon on campus which barely exists, but there's a major phenomenon and that is the virtual monopolization of the major media by private corporate entities. But what about the internet? I mean, you're huge on the internet. You can go around them. May I continue? Please do, yeah. Radically restricts the opportunity for freedom of, for expressing opinion and providing information. It's true that you can get around it in uh, peripheral ways, but this is an enormous constraint on freedom of speech. I, I can give you, look, let me give you an example of one of the cases that's not regarded interestingly as constraint on freedom of speech. Uh, I've published a number of books with a colleague, uh, Edward Herman of Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. The first book we published uh, was uh, published by a small but profitable uh, uh, a textbook publisher. It was called Counter-Revolutionary Violence. The, uh, they published 20,000 copies of it. Uh, the uh, uh, advertisements for it reached the conglomerate, one of the executives in the big conglomerate, uh, Warner Communications, now part of Warner Brothers, that uh, uh, owned the, uh, the publisher. He didn't like it. He ordered the publisher to uh, not to distribute the book. Uh, when they refused, uh, he put the entire publisher out of business, uh, destroying all of their stock. Is that a constraint on freedom of speech? Yeah, but it's not considered that because it's not state censorship. Well, Professor, I mean, you talked about 20,000 copies of a book. I predict our discussion here will have more than 20,000 views. I mean, I, I, I think you're disregarding the democrat, democratization of, of the Internet that allows anyone with a blog or a YouTube page or even a Facebook page to talk to literally millions. Do you discount that? No, of course I don't discount it. In fact, I've written about it, but it remains the case that overwhelmingly the media that reach the general public are under corporate control and highly restrictive. Are you not a, a, a form of a celebrity? Are you not a star? I, if I thought of the top 10 academics in terms of their reach and the passionate following they have, despite this corporate uh, uh, you know, embargo that you referred to, I would put it to you that you've been enormously successful. Your ideas have found great purchase. Aren't you a living disproof of your theory? Not at all. In fact, it has nothing to do with me. It's quite general. Uh, I mentioned one example uh, describing accurately the Iraq war, virtually impossible in the major uh, sources of information in the United States. Same with the Vietnam War. I mean, you mentioned the Vietnam War before. Did the left win that? I mean, is it possible to point out in the major media, and if, if so, please tell me where, that, uh, the United, that under John F. Kennedy, the United States invaded South Vietnam, uh, carried out a major act of aggression, uh, which then expanded to the point where it destroyed virtually all of Indochina in the worst crime uh, since the Second World War. Uh, tell me where you've seen the phrase invasion of South Vietnam in the mainstream media. I, I think that most movies about war, both in the Vietnam era and certainly in the Iraq era, uh, I mean, there's American Sniper on the one hand, but I could name you ten, ten anti-war films. But can I shift gears because you, you brought up foreign affairs and I'd like to, to plumb your views on that. May I ask you about foreign affairs and, and your thoughts on the Obama administration? There's a man, I would say, of the left, not just the liberal, but of the left, do you generally approve or disapprove of Obama's foreign affairs conduct? Uh, Obama is a man of the uh, center right. He's not, that's called the left in the United States, but that's an indication of the narrowness of the spectrum. Uh, uh, under Obama, if you look at global opinion, uh, which doesn't get published here, but it's real, uh, so Gallup polls of international opinion, you find that uh, the United States, the, the, one of the questions that's asked is which country in the world is the greatest threat to world peace? Uh, the United States is in the lead by a, no one else is even close, way behind in second place is Pakistan. Uh, others who are regarded here as the major threats are barely even mentioned. 
Well, surely the Islamic State and Boko Haram and Al Qaeda. Do you think that um, Barack Obama and the United States are a greater threat to peace than these Muslim terrorist groups I've just listed? You didn't ask. I didn't uh, say. I uh, didn't give you my opinion. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I gave you global opinion. Ah, okay. Global please. opinion as taken by the Gallup organization, the main polling organization. As far as I'm aware, that wasn't even published here, uh, but it's a significant fact. And if you look at the reasons, there are reasons. So, for example, uh, take uh, President Obama's global assassination campaign, the drone campaign. It is a campaign which openly, not secretly, targets people who are suspected of perhaps intending someday to do harm to us. Can you imagine if, uh, say, Iran was carrying out a global campaign to assassinate people who it thought might be of harm to them? I mean, we'd probably nuke them. But when we do it, it's fine, and it's called, and you call it left. Uh, I, I take your point. Are there any political uh, leaders in the United States that come close to expressing your views on, on foreign policy? Uh, or are all of the major parties bereft of such people? Oh, no, they have them. I mean, they're, and in fact, they range all over the spectrum. So there have been times when, say, Bernie Sanders expressed views very close to mine on foreign policy. There are times when Rand Paul did. Uh, let me ask you about uh, the United States. I know you're a strong critic of uh, the war on terror. You discussed your opposition to, to droning. And, and I think that you have been a leading critic of the United States' foreign policy for many years. But I want to bring you back to this Muslim terrorism I referred to earlier, the Islamic State, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab. There's too many to list. At what point does your criticism of the United States, however valid it may be, seem disproportionate given the threat of what I and some others regard as the new Nazism of these Islamic fascist theocracies? We've all seen the beheading videos and horrors that are reminiscent of the Nazis. At what point does it seem to exquisitely, uh, you know, uh, that you're making the perfect the enemy of the good, that you may have a uh, criticism of the United States, but it seems trivial to the threat that posed by radical Islam. Do you feel out of balance that you should criticize perhaps America's enemies more? No, I think the opposite. Uh, it's, first of all, it's always, uh, let's take, say, the, uh, let's take Iran, okay? Uh, the, the duty of an Iranian dissident inside Iran is not to join the huge chorus of condemnation of the crimes of Israel in the United States, though the crimes are very real, the duty of a honest dissident, an honest, uh, honorable person in Iran would be to criticize the crimes of Iran. And we understand that. In the old Soviet Union, we respected the dissidents, Sakharov and others, because of their criticism of the crimes uh, repression, violence of their own country. We didn't care what they said about uh, the U.S. war in Vietnam, but none of their, they, in fact, if they supported it, who cared? Uh, we honored them for doing what they had to do within their own countries. Same with Václav Havel. We honor him because we, uh, because of his uh, uh, struggle, his courageous struggle against repression and violence where he was, uh, whether the fact is that he did support U.S. crimes, but that's marginal. Do you regard uh, yourself I, as a dissident? This is quite different. Are you a dissident, Professor? Do I disagree with uh, what? What does a dissident mean? I don't know. You've been using the term. I, I, well, that's I, an interesting term. We use the term. The term conventionally is used in the United States only for critics in enemy states. We don't call critics in the United States or its allies, dissidents. That's part of a propaganda system. What and would you call yourself? A person who gives my opinion about uh, international domestic affairs. Well, but, but, be, but there's a flavor to, to your opinion. It happens to, be high, it happens to be the kind of criticism which we call dissidents in enemy states, mm -hmm. so therefore we should call that here too, not accept the propaganda uh, device of restricting it 
to enemies. We should apply it to ourselves as well. Now, I, I've, I've had, tried to continue. Mm -hmm. I'm not comparable to the dissidents in the Soviet Union in Iran for many reasons. For one thing, they were under, they're under much harsher repression, incomparably harsher. Secondly, I do extensively condemn the crimes of enemies. They didn't, in fact, but I do. So there's many differences. I appreciate that, and I'm glad you, you pointed those out. I, I want to ask you, uh, because you're such a strong critic or dissident uh, of the United States, is there a model society? Is there another country or jurisdiction that you think America should be more like? I, I, we all work towards a, a, an ideal or a utopia, but is there a manifestation of these ideals on Earth that you think America should be more like? I don't think there's any particular society that I would, if I were, li I can, any society that I can think of, if I were living there, I'd be criticizing what its, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, aspects of its policies that deserve harsh criticism. But you're more than just a grouch. You, you, you have a particular philosophy of, and I want to know if there's a place on earth that is more attuned to your flaw. I, I know you would criticize everything, and uh, so perhaps I'd call you a critic, not a dissident. Is Sorry. there a better society than America? Express, first of all, expressing criticism of society is not being a grouch. Uh, Václav Havel was not a grouch. Uh, Sakharov was not a grouch. They were doing something. Uh, Shirin Abadi in uh, Iran is not a grouch. They're doing something very significant. Uh, and they are not, and it's not just negative. You're not saying, look, stop this crime. It's also saying live up to this ideal. Right. For the United States, we should say, yes, we should live up to ideals that we profess. We profess a belief in democracy. Fine, we should try to live up to it. To the extent that we don't, it should be criticized and uh, not only just criticized, but active efforts should be made to overcome it. That's the role of I think any decent person. We call them dissidents in other countries, so let's call them that here. You're very patient with me. I have two last questions. Uh, I, you, you mentioned the ideals that all Americans are striving to live up to and which will probably never be met. I didn't say st which we claim to be living. We claim to be. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're very precise in your language and I, and I should uh, be more precise in my characterization of you. Are America's ideals themselves noble or do you uh, do you object to America's ideals as, say, expressed in the Constitution? Do you believe that the American Constitution is, is an idealistic document that we should work towards and strive towards? The, con the U.S. Constitution had uh, positive elements and uh, quite negative elements. Uh, so, for example, one part of the Constitution uh, authorized uh, the capture and return of slaves to their owners. Well, fortunately, many years later, that was overcome. There are other things in the Constitution that I think are um, quite admirable. There are others that should be changed. Uh, last, a document. last question. You've been very generous with your time, and my questions certainly are prodding you. You're very uh, kind to answer them. I want to talk about the Middle East. We've talked about it circuitously, but you are a critic of Israel. And, and I want to transpose your comments about being a critic of America to being a critic of Israel. Uh, Israel has its ideals that it is claims to want to live up to, to use your phrasing. Would you acknowledge that not only Israel's ideals, but the level it has achieved those ideals, its, its reality, is morally superior than, than its neighbors in the Arab world? Do you believe that Israel is a morally superior country than Iran or Syria or even Egypt? In some respects, in other respects not. Like what? Well, for example, uh, as compared with the others that you mentioned, Israel is a very aggressive state. For example, it's invaded Lebanon uh, five times. Uh, Iran hasn't invaded anyone. Uh, it's, uh, Israel is now in a gross violation of international law. The occupation is uh, has been uh, the actions of Israel in the occupied territories have been uh, uh, harshly condemned by the Security Council of the United Nations. In fact, Israel is violating its directives. Uh, the International Court of Justice has, in its advisory opinion, uh, concluded that these are in violation of fundamental international law. Uh, those are quite negative facts. 
On the other hand, internally, if you ask, uh, is Israel internally more uh, open, democratic, uh, less repressive than, say, Egypt? Yeah, sure, obviously so. That's why I'm a very harsh critic of the Egyptian dictatorship. Uh, last question, Professor. The, the U.S. State Department defines anti-Semitism as holding Israel to a double standard, that is, uh, pointing out, criticizing, attacking things only in Israel and not a, a criticizing them elsewhere. I, I'm not phrasing it exactly, but that, that's the gist of it. Do you think that by obsessing over Israel, you mentioned various UN hearings and investigations, uh, do you think that the world's obsession with Israel, while ignoring uh, similar prosecutions or examinations or condemnations of uh, Bashar Assad or the Islamic State, do you think that's a sign of anti-Semitism? And do you think anti-Semitism is on the rise in the world? That's like asking me, do I agree that the moon is made out of green cheese? First of all, it's not a fact. There's an overwhelming opposition to uh, the Islamic State, uh, to Assad, bitterly condemned. Uh, how can you say that they're not criticized? I mean, it's just overwhelming, including in the Islamic world. But in terms of formal UN resolutions, in terms of war crimes inspections, in terms of the International Criminal Court, in terms of the sheer number of resolutions, in terms of dealing with refugees, if you compare the inspection, criticism, and condemnation uh, and resolutions uh, against Israel for its occupation compared to Syria, it's... Well, which it's, occupation of Syria are you referring to? Well, let, let's say it's treatment of refugees, it's treatment of minorities. Syria has, had, has been amazing in its treatment of refugees. If we would only live up to that standard, it would be um, astonishing. I'm not talking about the last couple of years during the Civil War, but before that, the countries that absorbed refugees at a huge level were Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Iran. And these, incidentally, are refugees often from our crimes. We don't absorb the refugees from our crimes. They do. So several million people fled Iraq after the U.S. attack. Did they come to the United States? No. They were absorbed, not beautifully, I mean, pretty in harsh ways sometimes, but they were absorbed in the neighboring countries. We don't do that. Is anti-Semitism on the rise, Professor? And I'll let you go after this, but I am curious. Do you believe that anti-Semitism in Europe and in the Middle East is on the rise? Well, anti you have to be very careful here. Anti-Semitism and criticism of the policies of Israel are two very different Let's things. Let's talk about Jew hatred. Let's just phrase it that way. Do you think hatred of Jews, Jewish things, synagogues, uh, Jewish schools, Jewish people is on the rise in, in Europe and the Middle East? The Middle East is a complicated affair because remember that uh, uh, the, the, the situation in the Middle East is that the United States, is Israel with U.S. backing, crucial U.S. backing, is carrying out what the Israeli sociologist Baruch Kummerling called politicides, destroying the national rights of a national group. That's pretty serious. So in the Middle East, there's all kind of reactions to that. In Europe, there is a rise of uh, right-wing, uh, 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 sometimes neo-Nazi uh, forces, which does sometimes take an anti-Semitic... Uh, right-wing? What about the attacks in Paris, in Copenhagen? Are, are you calling Muslim extremists right-wing, Professor? Is that a code word? Will you address the Muslim anti-Semitism? About the rise of new... Uh, I can just go into it in detail, if you like. Those particular cases, which incidentally were massively condemned by the Muslim communities, both in Paris and in uh, Denmark, and in fact, just, just the other day in Norway, there were a thousand Muslims surrounding a, uh, a synagogue uh, in protecting it in condemnation of the attack in Copenhagen. But if you look at these attacks, just take a look at who the people were. You can find out, uh, for example, there's a detailed discussion in uh, the current issue of uh, France's leading uh, international affairs journal, Le Monde Diplomatique. They go through the background of the, uh, the assailants in Paris. They're Algerian. They come from the slums. They are products of the uh, bitter Algerian uh, atrocities 
in the 1990s, uh, from which their parents fled, uh, for which France had very significant, uh, in a, played a very significant role. It was supporting the military regime and the groups that these uh, the young men came from came out of the protest against that uh, f uh, uh, those actions. They live in very marginalized, repressed regions in Paris. They've been in and out of prisons. They've been involved in uh, the kind of crime that comes from repression and marginalization. It's a pretty ugly situation. But, Professor, it sounds like you're either just, trying to... But they uh, did, but... If, you're avoiding it. I mean, I'm, are, are you avoiding it or are you excusing no, it or, or are you denying it? Do you, do you deny that there's a, a rise in Muslim anti-Semitism in Europe? Neither denying it nor avoiding it, trying to understand it. So it, you acknowledge it exists it's easy, and is growing. It's, it's very easy to scream at people you don't like. Mm -hmm. It's more serious to try to understand what they're doing and take constructive actions to prevent it. If you want to scream, that's fine. You can always scream at your enemies. Professor, I've enjoyed our conversation today. You've been very generous with your time. I, I thank you. It's nice to meet you via Skype. And uh, we call ourselves the rebels over here, too. So we're dissidents in our own way. Great to talk to you today, Professor. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.